uh, it's all on the basis of personal relationships. Now, uh, okay, I, I know now, Orion, that your dad was in it, and is your mom the, the, uh, the head of the orphanage as well? Yeah, uh, my, my mom is uh, Mrs. Murphy. Oh. So there's, it's a whole acting family. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, my dad is, is a you know, pretty established character actor he from back is. in the day. So I grew up in the household. What? Lord. I'll get there. Uh, <laughs> I, constant reminders here. Okay. Uh, yeah, my mom is Mrs. Murphy, and then my brother-in-law, uh, Lauren Lester, plays Dr. Edwards. He's married to my sister Kelly. So you know, I kind of come from a actor-heavy family. Hey, if Judy Garland could have Liza Lorna and Joe on the Christmas show, your family can be in an Oz movie. They, this law of averages. I want to, um, I want to, we've got four parts to the program tonight, and we're kind of dividing everybody into a half hour segment each. And I'm sorry we don't have more time, but you guys will be around this weekend to talk to people, yes? And now, is the movie on DVD? Can people buy it? And uh, they can get it through you, or where do they get it? Well, it's uh, being sold here at the in the tent when the we're tent. when All we're right. out there, and also it's in the museum for well, sale. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, wholeheartedly, we recommend after the wizard, and especially this weekend when you can meet the people responsible, because I guarantee after you see the movie, you're going to wish you'd taken them all home with you. Well, anything else you got? And a, and yeah. a, big, a big shout out to Tori for coming out. Uh, this girl right here has a blog, has, a, has an Oz blog, and she gave us a year ago when she first got the DVD in the mail the most unbelievably emotional five minute review on YouTube that we all watched. And I just met her today, so and she's filming this, so I'm glad that we could do this. <laughs> Thank you, Jamel. And he's very and he's very humble. But Ryan J was the first reviewer to cover us on television. He he found us early. He, you might say he tracked us down and kept in touch so that he would be he would be the first. And he and he was the first to cover us on uh, on the NBC affiliate in Milwaukee. So we're very, very appreciative uh, to Tori and to Ryan and and, and to the festival. Well, I, I we're glad have... to be here, Jermel. No, I was actually going to say the same thing about Tori, but Orion likes to talk, so we just let him do it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Jordan, any last words? I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> you can't do better than that. The cast and the writer and the director of After the Winter. Thank you, folks. Most Munchkin, Munchkin by Messing Around. Uh, Whoa! who is still here with us. You'll hear the backstory of all that. But uh, she has been coming here. She came here for many years with her husband, Clarence Swenson, who was one of the Munchkin soldiers. And she was supposed to be in The Wizard of Oz, and she'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Please welcome back our uh, Munchkin by marriage from Pflugerville, Texas, Myrna Swenson. Next to her is a lady who was not a munchkin, although she's just about as diminutive and as charming as, as they were, uh, and in her own way more so, which is about as diplomatic as I can be. Uh, Karen Marshdahl was on the set of The Wizard of Oz in a very special capacity as a uh, stand-in for Judy Garland in the role of Dorothy. She has stories about that. She has other stories about her career that we're going to get into because she has had an extraordinary body of work, an extraordinary lifespan, an extraordinary body, period. Oh, hey! <laughs> and uh, we only kid like this now because Whoa. these are family reunions for a lot of us. And uh, as good as Karen is, I think I can outrun her. So I'm being a little bit more <laughs> irreverent than usual. Maybe not. Judy's stand-in, uh, a Hollywood icon of her own uh, power, Karen Marshall. Karen? Woo! And now a newcomer to the Oz stage. Uh, one of the things we have discussed, Barb and Colleen and Mark and I and, and many others who have been involved in Oz Stravaganza and indeed the other festivals around the country, what do we do when the Munchkins aren't able to travel anymore or be with us? 
And I always said, well, there's always the second generation of Oz, the third generation of Oz, the sons and daughters, the nephews and nieces, the grandchildren. Uh, over the years, we've been lucky to have here the daughter and granddaughter of Cowardly Lion, Bert Lahr. I'm hoping in the future that Judy's daughter, Lorna, will join us. Uh, Hamilton, Missouri is Margaret Hamilton's son, and he has children who remember their grandchildren without terror at all, oddly enough. And the young lady sitting to my right, far right, uh, comes by her Oz heritage very naturally. Her uncle was, um, with all due respect to everybody who went before and came after, probably the scarecrow most people remember. I would like you to meet the niece of MGM's oh scarecrow Ray Bolger, Christiana Ricard. <laughs> And Ryan and I are going to go back and forth and, and talk to all three of you. Um, if I, may. I had train tickets to go out to be in the movie. And just before we were to leave, I came down with an emergency appendectomy. Oh. And in those days, they didn't do surgery on Sunday, but they did me. <laughs> Mine was about to burst. So I had complications after that. And... By the time I was able to travel, they said, sorry, they couldn't use this. They had everything filled. So there went my dreams. So I married Clarence instead. <laughs> Did you? I, I think what's interesting, Myrna, too, and I want you to tell the folks a little about, bit about this. Both of your parents, you say all three of you had tickets to go to Hollywood. Your parents were little people as well. Yes, my parents were small. They were midgets also. And that was very, it's very unusual, yes? Uh, as far as they know at that time, and as far as I know now, I'm the only world's midget child born to midget children. Midgets don't have midget children. It's and would, not and, inherited. And would you tell us, please, how you met Clarence outside the movie theater? Because uh, you made quite an impression on him. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> If he'd lived three more months, we would have been married 65 years. That's amazing. True love never dies. And, I'm sorry? True love never dies. True, well, Myrna, I, I have a question. I'm curious about, um, because the Munchkins have been, you know, so organized, so well organized over the last few years when they could be at special events, the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame and the 70th anniversary of the Wizard of Oz in New York City and other things. Um, but among all of the events that you and your husband attended, was there one that really stands out as most memorable? Not that I can think of right now. No. I think the last thing Clarence did was the Walk of Fame. Is that right? When you all got your star? Yes, he was very happy at me. Because, and there's a doc, mini documentary on the uh, Oz DVDs that you get now that talks about that day when the Munchkins got their star, and, and Clarence is very, very visible that day. Yeah, he was very proud of that star. The, um, before I relinquish, have you relinquish the microphone, um, tell us about the day, though, that you met Clarence and how you met Clarence, because your folks knew him, I believe. Uh, yes, my, our parents knew each other, uh, but I was in high school, and he hadn't seen me since I'd grown up, and I had just been to a tea at my high school, so I was all dressed up. And he hadn't seen me since I was a little kid. He was nine years older than I was. And he was home one weekend to visit his family and had gone to a movie downtown. And he came out of the theater just as my parents and I were walking by. And he saw my parents and he stopped and talked to them. And I was standing right behind them. He was talking to them, but he kept looking at me all the time. <laughs> He was working in San Antonio at that time, and he came home every weekend back to Austin, every weekend after that. And how long till you were married after that? Uh, I finished high school first. We went together about four years, and we were married almost 65 years. And three daughters? Three daughters, five grandkids, and nine great-grandkids. Amen. Thank you, ma'am.
I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Karen, uh, Karen came to us first, I guess, about a dozen years ago. Is it now? Yeah, I'm, two thousand. Near oh, thirteen years ago then. Okay, and she was discovered by uh, two of the Oz Club members, uh, Bill Stillman and Jay Scarfone, I believe, and they kind of put you on the circuit. Isn't that right? The Oz Festival circuit, I mean. Were they the first to invite you to an event, or...? No, Gene was. Oh, Gene Nelson, in, in Chesterton, that festival. Lift it up just a little, honey. Uh, yeah. She started it. And I got a phone call from a call, a call in Chesterton. And I don't know anybody in Chesterton. Mm -hmm. And I said, who is this? She said, well, we have a Wizard of Oz festival, and I heard you were Judy stand-in, and we'd like to have you come. The first thing I said, will the Munchkins be there? Because <laughs> I love those little people. It was my favorite set. When you're 4'11", it's nice to be with the Munchkins. <laughs> you know, you feel tall. But Judy was only 4'11". People think she was tall. She was 4'11". We were exactly the same size. And that's one reason you got your job. That's how I got it. When we were in costume, we looked just alike. If we were back to back, you didn't see our faces. Just exactly the same. So. But when you came to the Oz set, and when they asked you to stand in for Judy, you casually knew her already, isn't that right? You had met her once or twice I before? I just met her briefly. That's through your all. sister? Yeah, through my sister. They were in the same school together. In junior at Bancroft, junior high, Bancroft. because Judy was Judy was a little younger than you are. Yeah. <laughs> well, what the heck? It's no secret now. <laughs> if Judy was here today in this tent with us, she would be 91. So if you figure in the movie, she was 16 years old. I was 19 years old. So figure that out. <laughs> And Karen, uh, and, and I have my very dear friend, do you remember Ann Rutherford? Oh, certainly. Yeah. She just passed on. But she was a very dear friend since our teens. And she always said to me, Karen, sweetheart, just stay vertical. <laughs> and that's what I've been trying to do ever since. <laughs> Stay vertical. <laughs> when you um, you had danced in films, though, uh, and that's one reason they knew you at MGM, isn't that right? Well, yeah. I would. My career was a dancer. I was dancing in all those musicals with those wonderful directors like Busby Berkeley, Nick Castle. I I can't even think of Chuck them. Walters. Chuck Walters. Yeah, the, they were one. I was so privilege to work with people like that. So I was basically a dancer and had been all my life since I was four. But, well, Wizard of Oz was the only one where I was a stand-in. And someone saw me on the set of the musical and said, you're just the size, you have the same appearance, would you like to be a stand-in for one of our new players? Judy Garland. Didn't mean a thing to me. <laughs> and so I was her stand-in, and she was a darling. 16 years old, you know. Did you guys have any moments, Karen, where you um, got to have lunch together during okay. set breaks and get to hang out as, like, girlfriends? We had lunch together in the commissary. In fact, in my book, I finally wrote my book because I couldn't answer all the questions people were always asking me about my career. So there's a picture in the book of Judy and me having lunch together in the commissary. And both dressed as Dorothy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I would have a chicken sandwich and chocolate milk and poor Judy could only have a bowl of soup. Oh. And if she had more than a bowl of soup, they reported her to the head office. Those jerks. Wow. Well, you know, you can't get heavy if you're playing a role. It's not easy to be an actor or an actress. Mm -hmm. You know, people think, even like with me, oh, how exciting, Karen, that you were in the movies, you were in the movies. It's work. And sometimes you don't even feel like 
doing anything. You know how we felt in that hot tent? <laughs> yes. Did you have felt like being charming and doing anything? You just want to be cool and well, shut up. That, I, think it's a, I think that brings up an interesting point because famously we always heard about Burt Lahr and Ray Bolger and Jack Haley and their costumes and how hot sets were in 1939. You mentioned enjoying being on set with the Munchkins as one of your favorite experiences. But what was the experience like? What can you describe in atmosphere for us? Because I think filmmaking is very different today. A lot of what is considered hot and effects are created in post-production after the principal photography wraps. So for you, can you tell us what the set smelled like, what it felt like, what you saw when you were standing in Dorothy's dress on that film set? Well, I'll tell you, in the first place, there was no air conditioning there. Ugh. That's what I said about Very the Very hot lights. 1939, there was no air conditioning. And they had these new Technicolor lights for the movie, because it was in color. And it was so hot. And what they would do, they would slide those big doors aside to let some cool air in for a few minutes, and they'd close it up again, the lights would come on, and we'd swelter again. How Bert Lahr got through it, I don't know. I think that uh, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt I think uh, one thing I can stress right now is that the stories of the scenes uh, in which uh, Karen stood by for Judy the reason Judy needed a stand-in other than the fact that she was a star but a lot of it had to do with her age and the fact that she could only work in the film four hours a day at, at age 16 all of that is in the book that Karen has mentioned are the books here this weekend Hollywood's Babe. Dancing Through Oz. Yeah. I was born in Hollywood. My nickname was Babe. So is there a better title for that? Yeah. Hollywood's Babe. But it is... It is all in the book, uh, along with a lot of other extraordinary information about the musicals, about the other films Karen did, uh, westerns. Uh, I always kid her about... Uh, she was a prominent young lady star in what was notoriously referred to as an army hygiene film during World War II. Oh dear. That's in the book. She survived a near-fatal plane accident. Plane crashed into the side of the mountain. She lived. Uh, her leg, her foot was shattered. Her ankle was shattered. The doctors told her she probably would never walk again. She has been dancing ever since. That's Take great. that under advisement. At any rate, this is all in the book, and I cannot uh, too strongly recommend that uh, you get that book while you're here and meet Karen and uh, have her sign it for you. And there are over 100 pictures in the book that haven't been seen before, so you might like that. Trust me, they like it. It's a great world because I get satisfaction and I don't have any hang-ups about it. I belong to the people. As long as I can send them home saying, gee, he made me feel happy. Well, that's my life. That's what I work for, to give people joy. And that is a quote from Ray Bolger, and it is on the back of Christiana Ricard's book, Remembering Oz, My Journey with the Scarecrow. Uh, just jump in and, and let's hear a little bit. Let's talk about Ray first and then we'll talk about the book and your journey because sure, they're two sure. stories that intertwine but they have their own special import, each of them alone. Sure. I, I'm not interested in talking about my story tonight because I, I feel like I want to uh, bring what my uncle, you know, these people will never get to meet my uncle Ray and I just really want to bring who he was for you guys. We. You know, I, I don't really have much to say about myself, but um, I I wanted to share my little experience. Please. Anyway, so I was I drove over here from Boston, and I was very close to my uncle Ray, and I started hearing him, you know, in my head, his voice, which was of course very distinctive, and I was saying, you know, well, what do you, you know, what do you want me to say to the people? He used to say to me. Be with the people, you just, you've got to be with the people, and I didn't know what it meant. But anyway, so I was asking him in the car, I said, you know, show me what you want me to tell, because there's so much uh, that I could, I could talk for two days about uh, our childhood and, and our family and what it was like growing up with him, and it was, it was not, it wasn't ordinary. It was, it had some, it, for us it was kind of magical, 
and my uncle Ray was quite wizardly, and uh, you know we didn't couldn't really distinguish between the the scarecrow and our uncle because we were pretty little when we started watching the movie on TV, and then he would be there in person, and then suddenly he'd be doing character parts and acting scarecrowy or acting mm -hmm. like the Wicked Witch and doing the cackles and also it's a little blurry for, for for me in my head. It's all sort of one big Oz kind of an experience, so. Uh, I never know when it's going to hit me. When I was watching his video and I heard the music from the new Oz, which I've not seen yet, but just hearing the music and seeing the green pictures and I kind of start going into my something sort of magical. But uh, that's kind of the effect that my uncle had on us. A little bigger than everyday life. And he was a very, very intelligent, super intelligent man, super creative, very hardworking, dedicated to uh, his his talents. My wife was the same uh, kind of person, very dedicated to him and his career. She left all of her uh, talents to the side to uh, kind of manage his career for many, many years. And she produced um, the play Where's Charlie, which he started on Broadway. And he won the Tony Award for that, uh, that year. Uh, well, it was on for several years. My mother was in that uh, production also. It's really amazing. I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She saw it. Wow. I can't sing, so I won't torture anyone. Uh, that's a two-day question. <laughs> yeah, because it was always, you know, it was many, many years that we had together. It was a close family. It wasn't. He wasn't an uncle that I saw once in a blue moon. Uh, my aunt Gwen and uncle Ray were like a second set of parents to me in many ways, and. Um, so, yeah, we always had Aussie things, and some more than others, but there were so many other things also, you know, the music from Where's Charlie and other kinds of things, and just, you know, my Uncle Ray loved to tell his whole history about vaudeville and, you know, all the different things, traveling through these little towns like Chittenango when he was in vaudeville. He was a great storyteller, loved to tell you vivid memory, so he would just recreate the whole thing. Did he ever, if I could just, curious, like, and John, you'll have to, you'll have to be the fact checker for this question, but there's the other Judy Garland film that Ray appears in, it's, um... The Harvey Girls. Right, okay, that, and the Harvey Girls, you know how there's that great, he has that great dance number at the party? Um, did he, in any part of entertaining and playing with you growing up, did you get him to dance for you? Well, he danced all the time, you know, we, we would go, we'd get, my aunt would call if, 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 she, if, we, if there were tickets for us to go see uh, the Johnny Carson show or, you know, some of the different variety shows that, would, that he would be on when, when he was in Los Angeles because they lived between L.A. and New York. And uh, we'd go and we'd see him, primarily we'd see him dance at those performances, which were always just really magical, I must say. Do you know Judy's famous line about Ray? She said Ray Bolger is the only person she knew who went to lunch wearing his tap shoes, just oh, in case. How, but, oh, how funny. Well, see, that's a good point. So he was always ready to perform, and I, you know, I, I write about that in the book when the tour buses would go by the house and he'd hear the, the announcer saying, this is the Scarecrow's house. He'd get up from the lunch table and run outside, do a big kick for the bus, and then come back to the house. And, you know, not much of a line between real life and the theater for him. I can understand that completely. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. If I would have a piano out there and a mic and do, you know, 16 yeah. bars of, of something. The, um, the, one of the interesting points I want to make, too, and I didn't say this, and perhaps they don't know, is that your Uncle Ray and your Aunt Gwen had no children of their own. So that is another right. reason they were particularly close to, uh, to your family and, right. and to the other, the other children uh, in the environs. Um, I don't want to um, give it all away. I think that uh, one of the remarkable things about Christiana's book, Remembering Oz, is that it is her journey with the Scarecrow, but it's also her journey with the philosophies of Oz as she learned them from him and as she's been exposed to them because of her family history, uh, how all of it helped her through her own personal uh, health battle with cancer. So again, this is another very, very fine read. You've got two uh, supreme authors up here. Uh, Myrna would write her story, but they'd have to bind it in asbestos. It's just too hot to tell. So, uh, Do we have time to 
share this? Oh yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, I, I just have to share this because this is something for you guys. Uh, when I first got here, I stopped in the uh, Wizard, there's a uh, the Land of Oz uh, store with all of the memorabilia. And the woman who runs that is a little closer. The, the woman, uh, Karen, who runs the place, she saw me looking at this little clock with my Uncle Ray. I was looking in the case at it. And for some reason, it just caught my eye. And I read it, and it said, on the clock, it says, time to be wise. And I said, okay, Uncle Ray, that's what you want me to say? I'll tell him it's time to be wise. I'll tell that. And she, suddenly, she says... That clock hasn't worked for years, and I'd like you to have it. And I said, oh, no, no, I, I, I couldn't possibly. You know, he probably just needs a new battery. No, we've tried everything. It doesn't work. And I said, well, okay, I'd love to have it. I took it home. This is Thursday night. I put it on top of the television oh, set. It didn't work. I woke up the next morning, and I noticed that the hands were not in the same place they had been the night before. The clock works perfectly. I set the right, the correct time. It is now 7:35 or 7:40, and for me, it's not a big stretch to think that my uncle Ray has a hand in this, <laughs> or maybe a foot. Um, as promised, Margaret Pellegrini. Woo! I know is wake up and sleep your head, rub your eyes, get out of bed. Wake up to her kid with the dead. She's gone where the goblin go below, 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 and all. Holy up and sing. And mean girl, got mean dong girl, yo. Sing it high, sing it low. Let them know the wicked witch is dead. Oh. <laughs> There'll always be a wizard of Oz. It'll never die. Because you know, this young generation, they get married, they have children, they raise their kids up and on the Wizard of Oz, and uh, it'll just keep going on and on and on and on. Because of the meaning. I love kids, and I love to go around and they'll come out and say, Mama, look at that little monster. And the mother says, Shh, don't do that. I say, Oh, don't say that. I am a munchkin. I said, do you like the Wizard of Oz? And they said, yeah. I said, well, I played in it. No. And they get, and can we have your autograph? Can we have your picture? Well, I went to Memphis, Tennessee, to visit my sister. And uh, when I got out there, I, uh, my brother-in-law says, go and help me at the fairgrounds and pass out samples of potato chips. And I said, okay, I will. So I went. Little people came down the midway, and they asked me to join their show. I said, I don't want, I, at that time, I didn't know I was going to be small. And uh, they said, give us your name and address, which I don't always do, but... I'm glad I did because they took it and gave it to an agent two years later. And uh, it was a letter from an agent asking me to come and be in a movie called The Wizard of Oz. So I answered their letter and my dad did rather. We answered the letter and uh, next thing I knew I was on a train going to Hollywood. Got off the train that morning, and uh, they had uh, Oscar, the chauffeur for the car, and they had a little fellow waiting for me. We got off the train, and they met us, and we went out to MGM Studio. It was wonderful. It was fantastic. Oh, beautiful. I never saw anything like it, you know, coming from a small town. I was with all the little people that I had never been with before. I didn't know. I met this one, I met that one, and, and it was great to be among 126 little people.
But you know what gets me? They'll say, oh, did you ever meet Judy Garland? I said, well, I work with her every day. She was on my set every day. I work with her. Well, if, if they saw the movie, they should say that Judy is on the movie all the time. She was real nice to all the little people. She was amazed about so many little people. She asked a lot of questions, how we were, where, and we were real friendly with her. But like I tell everybody, she was a typical teenager, nice as she could be. Mickey Rooney was very sweet on duty. Every day at 12 o'clock, he used to come on our set and come out the door and uh, take her for lunch. Judy Garland got her, her own private trailer uh, for the uh, Christmas of 1938. And Christmas, when we, when we went to work that morning, they gave her the scissors and they told her to go cut the ribbon, that red ribbon over in the corner. They had her private dressing room sitting in the corner. And she went over there and cut it. And uh, she said, uh, you know, whenever they give you your own dressing room on wheels, well, you're considered to be a star. Well, she was so excited. Well, she invited us all in her dressing room to look at, to see it. And sitting there, she had a whole stack of pictures, eight by ten pictures of her. She gave each one of us, one of them, for her, uh, her present, a Christmas present to us. On mine, it says, to Margaret from your pal, Judy. And I still have it today. Oh, Toto was, uh, oh, he was wonderful. But you know what? I was mad at Toto. He made more money than I did. <laughs> See, he made $125 a week, and I only made 50 um,